Where's my pick? Good morning. Glad you've, you've joined us on this day. It's a special day. Uh, it's a, a busy day, but a special day. And we're going to, this morning, I'm going to do my best to close out this series in, in 1 John. Planned on closing it out last week, and there's just too much in this last little section here. And uh, so we're going to close it out today, and then at, at the close of our service, we'll have our March for Missions, where we will give to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But we're coming to the end of this study in 1 John. If you've got your Bibles, turn 1 John chapter 5. We're going to start in verse 13. And through this series, we've talked about birthmarks of a true believer. What are the, the characteristics of someone who is truly a follower of Jesus? And through this, we have seen a number of them. Uh, it's not a, an exhaustive list, what we've gone through. There's more that you could pull out of here. Uh, you know, with Scripture, usually you don't get a, a numbered list. Here's ten things. You know, sermons a lot of times are that way. Here's three points for today. But the Bible's not necessarily broken down quite as neatly as that. And so we've tried to pull some different uh, characteristics out of the Scripture. And there's probably more we could find in there. But these are some, some basic things that we as believers should find in ourselves. If we are truly following Jesus, we should see these things in ourselves. Now the, the thing we need to remember is that this isn't just a list of do's and don'ts. This isn't a list of things. You need to do all these things in order to be a Christian. You need to, to check off all these boxes in order to, to be a follower of Jesus. That's not what we've read about and that's not what is being said in the scripture here. What instead is being said is that these are evidence of a true believer. This is a byproduct of having a relationship with Jesus. If you really have a relationship with Jesus, if you're really following him closely, here's some things you're going to see. Not Here's some things you need to really work on in order to become a Christian. And so when these, when these marks are not present, then we need to look at ourselves. We need to sincerely look at ourselves and say, did, did I really make a decision to follow Jesus? Or, and if I did, if it was a true salvation experience, then have I been living an abiding life in Christ? Because that's what produces these things. And so we need to, to examine ourselves. These, these marks that we've seen are for ourselves, to be able to look at ourselves and say, am I truly a follower of Jesus? And to be able to look at others, not just for the fun of it, so we can say, oh, I don't think so, yeah, you're probably good. It's not for that, but so that the church can be pure. So we can look at the church and say, hey, this person's trying to teach and they're not showing the marks of a true believer. This person's trying to be a leader and they don't live up to what scripture says a true believer looks like. It gives us this baseline to be able to see what a true believer looks like. And so today we're looking at chapter 5 verses 13 through 21. There is a ton of information in these last few verses there's a, a short passage we're going to talk about in here that is one of the most debated passages in all of Scripture, and, and um, we're not going to be able to finish that debate today, uh, but we'll look at that a little bit and uh, try to give you as much information as possible. But let's read 1 John chapter 5, verses 13 through 21. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask, and God will give him life to those who commit sins that do not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that does not lead to death. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who has been born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. 
He is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Interesting way to close out a letter. But he starts in this section talking about something we've come back to over and over and over again. Assurance. Confidence in our salvation. He, he hits us. And so we've already established that this is a birthmark of a true believer. But we want to revisit it a little bit today because he says something here very important. He says that he's writing these things so that we will know that we have eternal life. Not so that we can guess we have eternal life or that we can hope we have eternal life so that we can know we have eternal life. This is possibly in all of scripture the most direct verse that we have about our assurance of salvation where we can say, I know I'm saved. He says that we can know that we are saved. Now it's not to say that we're never going to have doubts, that we're not going to wonder, but we can be confident in the promises of God. We can be confident in the word of God And we can be confident when we see this fruit in our lives that we are truly saved. We have assurance of our salvation. But on the other side of this, Satan is trying to to undermine that and say, eh, you're you're not good enough. Or all this stuff is just made up. That Bible you have, that's not true. He's trying to undermine this and convince us all these terrible things that are untrue. And so what John's saying here is that we have confidence in the word of God. We have confidence in the promises of God. We have confidence in what we see even in our own lives, the fruit of a true believer. And because of that, we can trust in him. We can have confidence in God. Just like a a friend or a family member who you trust, you know you can go to that person. Maybe a coworker, you know the people you can trust, and you know the people you can't. And this is saying God is someone we can trust. And that leads us into our first birthmark that we're talking about today, because he immediately goes from this this topic of confidence in our salvation to prayer, taking our request to God. And so this trust that we have in God allows us to go to him and say, God, I need this, or I want this. And so our first birthmark today is a true believer wants what God wants. Let's read verses 14 and 15 again. It says, and this is, this is the confidence we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. There are a lot of, there are a lot of false teachers out there who are going to try to To tell you that verse means, I mean, you just ask God for anything, he's going to give you whatever you want. He just wants you to be rich and happy and uh, he's just going to give you everything you want. But notice what he says here. He's not saying, I'm going to give you everything you ever want. He says, if we ask anything according to his will, if we ask it according to his will, then he's going to hear us and he's going to grant our request. We can be confident of that. Now, if our request is not in the will of God, then he's probably not going to give it to us. And so we need to understand that. Don't listen to the teachers out there who say, I mean, you should ask God for anything, you know, a new new fancy car or, you know, a new house and whatever you want, God's going to give it to you. No, that's not the case. But if you ask something that is in line with God's will, he will hear us and he will grant our request. And so what we need to understand in this is as we abide in Christ, our our will will line up with his over time. It's not an instant thing, but our will will line up with his. Our desires will line up with his desires. We will begin to want what he wants. And when that happens, the things that we ask for are the things that he wants. And then he'll give them to us. Let me tell you a quick story. When uh, when Katie and I got married, I've never told anyone this before. All right, got married. We had a a major fundamental difference of opinion, of a truly ethical problem. And and essentially, what happened was we we were raised differently. And when we got married, there was this clash of worldviews. See, 
she was raised in a house where the toilet paper comes over the top. <laughs> right? And I was raised in a house where it came out from underneath. And so we got married, and all of a sudden, there was trouble. <laughs> and especially because, you know, we just had the one bathroom when, when we first got married, so it wasn't even like we could each have our own. And so, so for the first little while there, it was a, a constant fight for the orientation of the toilet paper. Uh, you know, I, if I put it on, I was going to put it on my way, and if she put it on, she would put it on her way, and if I put it on my way, she'd come behind me and flip it around, and, you know, it was this, this battle. Um, we, we've survived it, though. But what's happened over time is I realized, for one thing, if I put it on my way, she's just going to come and flip it around, so why bother? And then I realized, you know what? Who cares? If this makes her happy, I'll put it on, on this way. I, you know, what difference does it really make? And that's how it kind of started. But I, I can tell you now, after, after almost 12 years, I actually prefer it over the top now. <laughs> right? And now some of you think that's blasphemy, but... but I <laughs> But, but my preference has actually changed. And we lived happily ever after. <laughs> now, this is, this is really silly, right? This is a silly illustration, but, but understand what I'm trying to say here. When, before we have a relationship with Christ, we're in opposition to God. Scripture tells us we are enemies of God. We are, we are in opposition to Him in every way. And when the relationship begins, when the marriage begins through salvation, suddenly we realize where what we want is in opposition to what he wants. We see all of a sudden, hey, this thing that I love so much is in opposition to what God wants. Unfortunately, a lot of times that leads to us saying, well, I still want what I want. I'm going to do what I want. But hopefully over time, as, our, as we mature in our relationship, we say, you know what? I need, to, I need to deny myself, as Scripture says, deny myself and follow him. And so we, we start to give up what we want and seek what he wants. We, we put aside, we sacrifice what we want, and we look toward what God wants. But over time, as we do that more and more and more, as our relationship with God deepens, what we want begins to shift, and it begins to look more like what he wants. Instead of just sacrificing what we want to do what God wants, we begin to actually want what God wants. And we forget about those things that we used to want. That's what we're talking about here. As we mature in our relationship with Christ, our will begins to line up with His. And when that happens, we ask for anything and He'll give it to us because what we want is what He wants. Don't let anyone ever tell you, God just wants you to be happy and it doesn't, it doesn't matter what you want. God just, just wants you to be happy. Even if it's, it's contrary to his, his will and the word of God, he just wants you to be happy. God does want you to be happy, but you know what's going to make you happy? Him. He's not going to give us everything we want unless everything we want is everything he wants. And unfortunately, our sinful nature wants a lot of things that God doesn't want. And so as we mature in our relationship with Christ, as we live an obedient life, like we've talked about for the last few weeks, as we live in obedience to Him, that's going to shift our will and our desires to look more like His. And when we want what He wants, then this, what the Scripture says comes to life. We ask for anything, and He's going to give it to us. So jump into verses 16 through 19. This is a, a really difficult passage of scripture. I'll be honest with you. This is, this is one that I've struggled with for a long time. Uh, we're going we're gonna to read that, those verses again. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a couple different interpretations of this. And, and I'll, I'll kind of tell you where, where I lean in this, but this is really a difficult part of scripture and we'll try to pull some principles from it. I, I wanted to just kind of breeze by it, but I don't think that's the right thing to do. So let's read 16 through 19. It says, if anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask, and God will give him life. To those who commit sins that do not lead to death, excuse me, God will give him life to those who commit sins that do not lead to death. There is sin 
that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that does not lead to death. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who has been born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. So he says here, if we see a brother committing sin that doesn't lead to death, we should pray for him. But if we see someone committing a sin that does lead to death, we don't need to bother praying for him. What, what is he talking about? Again, this is, this is uh, you, if you grab five commentaries and read them, you're probably going to get five different stories. Uh, but I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you two interpretations here that, that I think both could make sense and I'll tell you where, where I kind of lean. But the first one is that he's talking about physical death. Physical death here. Saying that there are sins that when committed are punished by death. Now, to give you some, some background in this, the Old Testament, you have example after example. Uh, Nadab and Abihu in Leviticus 10, they're deliberately disobedient to God dead. Uh, Achan and his family, remember Achan, they, they, Jericho came down and God said, you guys can have whatever you want except these things are devoted to me. And he's, he kind of liked them, so he took some for himself. Him and his family are stoned to death. They were punished by death. Uh, Uzzah, you remember him? I don't know why we don't name our kids those kind of names anymore. But Uzzah was, was one of the guys responsible for, for keeping the Ark of the Covenant and the ox stumbled, and, and he valiantly leaned out to catch it, dead. Not allowed to touch it. Now that seems harsh, but re, go back and read that scripture. It, it was very clearly against what God had commanded. But there are times in the Old Testament we see where somebody commits a sin, or somebody, you know, sometimes it's not one particular sin, but a series of sin. Uh, Korah and his troop in Numbers chapter 16, they, they were going to take over. They were, gonna, they were coming against Moses and they were going to take over and God judged them with death. So sometimes it's not one specific thing but a series, uh, a life of sin or a series of things that lead to it. But there are times when God punished with death. In the New Testament we see a few examples. Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira. You remember them? The church is new. People are struggling Many of them probably lost their jobs as a result of following Christ. And so the church is responding by selling their own possessions to give to other people in the church, to meet the needs of the people in the church. They're selling property, they're selling whatever they can, and they're bringing the money to the apostles and they're distributing it to whoever has need. And so Ananias and Sapphira, they want to get in on this. They sell some property and they bring the money. But the problem was... They wanted the, the praise of giving to this cause, but they also wanted to keep some for themselves. So they kept a little back, kept a little of that money. And then they told Peter, they said, yeah, that's all of it. We gave it all to you. Peter said, you're not just lying to me, you're lying to the Holy Spirit. And so Ananias, the first one that lied to him, dead. They drag him out. Three hours later, his wife comes in. Oh, yeah, that was, that was all the money. Yeah, that was it. And he said, hey, see, see those guys walking up? They just dragged your husband out. Now they're going to drag you out. She drops dead. God judged them immediately with this. In, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul's giving instructions on the Lord's Supper. He gives a lot of instructions, but essentially it boils down to you should not take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. And in verse 30, he says, That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. In other words, many of you are sick, and some of you have died because you've taken the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, because of the sin in relation to the Lord's Supper. And so there's clearly, in the Old Testament and New Testament, there are times where God says, That's enough. You're done. And punishes with physical death. And so, to kind of support this interpretation is the fact that John calls the sinners brothers. He says, if you see a brother who is sinning, then you should pray for them. And so, 
typically in Scripture when we see the word brother, it's talking about a member of the family of God. And so if these are truly followers of Jesus, if these are believers, then we have to believe that he's talking about physical death. Otherwise, we would have to believe that there is something bad enough that we could do to lose our salvation. If he's not talking about physical death, then he's saying there's something that's bad enough that you could lose your salvation. And we don't believe that. Eternal security is, is taught throughout Scripture. And so we don't believe that to be the case. And so if they are truly believers, then this has to be in reference to physically dying. Hebrews chapter 12 talks about God disciplining his children. And so it's not beyond the realm of possibility that God's discipline would go as far as taking someone's life physically. Not taking away their eternal life, but taking away their life physically. And so if this is what he's talking about, if John is talking here about physical death, then what he's saying is that when we see a brother, when we see a believer, a fellow believer who is, is in sin, we need to pray for them. We need to pray for them, and our intercession could lead that person back on the path of righteousness, could lead them to repentance. And if we don't, <coughs> excuse me, if we don't, and if they continue, it could lead to death. Hebrews 12, 9, in, in this section about discipline, he says, we've all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? So essentially applying, when we submit to the discipline of, of God, we live. When we don't submit to it, there's a chance it could lead to our death. So we pray for believers who are in sin, that they would turn from it and turn back to God. But when someone is sinning in such a way that is bringing harm to the church, someone is sinning in such a way that it is hurting other believers, John says, I'm not going to say you should pray for them. He doesn't forbid it. He doesn't say you, you cannot pray for them. But he's basically saying, if God's made up his mind on judging this person, don't waste your time. Pray in the will of God, as we talked about before. If it's God's will to judge this person and he's made up his mind, then we don't need to bother now, the catch is, we don't know when that happens, unless somebody drops dead. We don't know when God has decided that, so we simply pray when we see somebody who's caught in sin. So that's, that's our first interpretation, physical death. Sometimes there is sin that leads to physical death. The second interpretation is, is talking about spiritual death. Not physically dying, but spiritually experiencing spiritual death, and and. The reason this one makes sense is this whole letter has been dealing with false teachers, people who have, have been raised up in the church and have gone out and are now teaching false things and leading people astray. And so what he's saying, <coughs> excuse me, if, if this is true, then what he's saying is that, that the brother here is somebody who is a, a counterfeit brother, somebody who's been in the church, they've been part of of the, the congregation, but they're not part of the family. And so you, you may call them a brother, but they're not truly part of the family. And so in this, in this case, what he's talking about here is someone who is part of the church body. They may not be a true believer, but they're part of the church. And you see them start to stray, start to follow fa false doctrine, start leading down the road of apostasy, and we need to pray for them. And God will give them life, meaning eternal life. God will, will save them. God will, will help to turn them around and bring them back on the path of righteousness. Those we should not pray for are the ones who have abandoned the faith and are now coming back and trying to destroy the body through false teaching. These, what he calls antichrists earlier in, the, in this letter, these false teachers who have come back and they're trying to destroy, they're trying to tear the church apart. He's saying... Don't even bother with them because God's made up his mind. Jesus, in Mark chapter 3, when the Pharisees say, hey, these, these things Jesus is doing, I, I think his, that power is coming from Satan. 
And if you remember what Jesus said to him, he said, that's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. He said, that will never be forgiven. Seems harsh, but it's from the mouth of Jesus. He says, there, there is something there. You're not coming back from that one, guys. And, and it's possible that these false teachers, these people who are going about to destroy the body of Christ, who are making false claims about Christ, just like the Pharisees did, That God is saying, they've sealed their fate. They've made up their mind. You don't need to bother praying for them because God is going to judge them. Now, to to kind of support this, this view of this passage is the fact that over and over and over in this letter, John has said, a true believer doesn't keep on sinning. A true believer doesn't continue in sin. Verse 18, right after he says this, it says, everyone born of, born of God will not keep on sinning. And so, if that's the case, if a true believer would never get to the point where they would fall away from the faith and come back and attack the church and try to lead other people astray, if somebody who has experienced the grace of God and salvation would never do that, then he must be talking about false brothers here. I personally tend to lean toward this second interpretation because I believe it fits with the context of the letter where he's talking about these false teachers and the people within the church who are being led astray by them. Again, we can't be uh, 100% sure on, on what exactly is meant here, but the point is this. We as Christians need to commit to pray for our brothers and sisters who are struggling with sin. When we see someone in the church who is caught in sin, our our typical response, hey, did you see what so-and-so did? Or we, you know, we go home and say, oh, man, I saw, I heard so-and-so did this with what's-his-name. You know, we, we gossip and we judge people. And what this says is when we see a brother or sister in sin, we need to fall on our knees and pray for them, that God would bring them out of that. Don't don't resort to gossip. Don't resort to judgment. Just pray. If we see someone in the church or who comes into the church that is seeking to destroy, who is seeking to harm the body, we need to pray for them. We need to get them out of here. We might need to pray for them. that they, having, uh, having been able to sit in on elders meetings for the past few months during our transition time, I can tell you, we have elders in this church that if somebody walked in here and started teaching false doctrine from here, I'm confident they would be physically dragged out of the building (laughs) and shown the door. Uh, That's the job of an elder, by the way, and that's what we need to do sometimes. If someone is, is here to harm the body of Christ, it's not time to say, let's pray for that person. It's time to get them out of here. And so we need to understand that. We need to pray for our brothers and sisters. We need to pray for people in this church. We need to pray understanding that if somebody is, is caught up in sin in the, in the body, that person may not be a true believer. And our prayers, our intercession may lead them to faith in Christ. We need to pray for people. A true believer prays for others. Our last birthmark. This is our last one for the whole, this whole series is that a true believer knows the truth. The last two verses says, And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know Him who is true. And we are in Him who is true, in His Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. I love here that he says he's he's a true God and He... He is eternal life. Not he has eternal life. Not he gives eternal life. He is eternal life. John closes out his letter with this last characteristic. A true believer knows the truth because we know the one who is true. We live in the one who is true. He is the true God. And if we have a personal relationship with him, we will know the truth. We will live according to the truth, not according to the lies of the world. And this last statement he makes, the very last verse, it kind of seems out of place. Little children, 
Keep yourselves from idols. I mean, if you're writing a letter, is that how you're going to end your letter? Typically, no. But, but this is his last thing he throws in here. And it, it may seem out of place, but it fits perfectly. First of all, because the people he's writing to are living in a culture where idol worship is, is rampant. There, he's, most believe that he's writing this in Ephesus. And Ephesus is a major center of pagan worship. Read, go back and read Acts chapter 19. When, when all these people, these artisans that make idols and shrines and these pagan articles of worship, they, they make these things and they get together and say, we need to do something about Paul because he's leading people to Christ and those people are no longer buying our stuff. He's hurting our business and they cause a riot. I mean, that's how much idol worship played into the life of people in Ephesus. And so this is where he's at. He's writing to these people who are living next door to idolaters. They're they're probably selling their goods in the market right next to somebody who's selling idols and shrines and all these things. It's part of their life. So it makes perfect sense to them to say, stay away from that stuff. Steer clear of that stuff. But it also has to do with the nature of what John is is writing about in the letter as a whole and in this last section. He's saying, we know the truth. We've been given understanding of the truth because we know the one who is true. We are in the one who is true. So don't live a lie. You see, 1 Corinthians 8, chapter 4 says that an idol is nothing. It has no real existence. It is nothing And so to worship an idol is to worship a lie. So he says, you know the truth. You live in the one who is true. You know the one who is true. So don't live a lie. Don't worship a lie. Don't worship these idols. And and for us, sometimes we look at these verses about idol worship and say, eh, that doesn't really apply to me. Well, we may not have little shrines in our houses or... Or things like that. We sure have some idols though. It may, it may not be that little shrine. But it may be our house. Or our money in the bank. Or our material goods. It may be people. Or famous people. Or anything. You name it. John's saying here. Live for what is true. Don't live for a lie. The, the world wants to tell you to live for this lie. Don't live for that. Live for God. Live for what is true. All of these characteristics that we've seen over the last couple months help us understand, am I a true believer? And are the people I'm with true believers? We should hopefully have the confidence to say every week who we sit in Sunday school with, who we go to social events with. Hopefully we would have the confidence to say, hey, Tell me about, tell me about your, when you got saved. If you have a question about somebody, don't be mean about it. But we need to understand people need a relationship with Christ in order to look like Christ. And so if we see people in our church that are not exhibiting the birthmarks of a true believer, let's try to work with them. Let's pray for them and let's try to work with them to bring them to that point. If you don't see those marks in your own life, you need to get right with God. I'd love to talk to you about that. Anytime you would like to have a conversation about your relationship with Christ, come and find me. Call me, email me, text me, come to my house. I would love to talk to you about your relationship with Christ. Look back over these these characteristics. You've got, I think we ended up with 14 There they are on the screen there. We won't read through them today, but they're on your notes there. The notes are available online. Look at those things. Look at your life and say, do I exhibit these characteristics and am I growing in these things? Am I growing in my confidence? Am I growing in my obedience? Am I growing in my sacrificial love? Seek to become more and more like Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for the sacrifice that you made on the cross. 
We thank you that you want what's best for us. And Lord, sometimes we know that means what's best for us is not what we want. But I pray that we would be people who give up what we want for what you want. We would be people who would sacrifice our desires for your desires. We would seek to follow after you with everything we are. And Lord, now as we come to, to give again of ourselves sacrificially above and beyond what you've called us to give to this missions offering, Lord, I pray that you would bless this money and bless those who give and bless those who will experience the benefits of this, both the missionaries and those they are reaching on foreign soil. Use it to expand your kingdom, to draw people to you so that the world will know that you are God and you alone. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.